So thank you everyone for coming here. Um, we might get a few more trickling in as we go, but uh, we'll have lots of time for questions at the end. Um, so yeah, make sure to write down any questions or type them into, into the chat as we go along. Um, and as well, I was just mentioning this will be recorded. So we'll be posting uh, a link or we'll be posting the video up onto YouTube and sending out a link to everybody as well as posting it on uh, all of our social media channels. So if uh, you know anybody that wasn't able to attend or anybody you think uh, might benefit from this, feel free to share it with them afterwards. Yeah, so I guess go to the next slide. So yeah, just to do a quick agenda of what we want to go through today. First gonna give you, first go over two things I forgot to put on the agenda, and then we'll uh, go into an intro about expert VR and what we've done in the past, talking about our some of our past experience with VR classrooms. And we'll have Rob Terrio come on uh, to talk about his experience running VR classes at Georgian College. And then uh, Drew will take over talking about some of the different remote learning softwares that are available either for free or at lower cost to be able to create simulations or to utilize what's already available. And then we'll have a Q&A section uh, where we'll answer as many questions as we can. <clears throat> Great. So yeah, before, before we jumped into all of the virtual reality and everything, I wanted to go over some acronyms because I know some people uh, may be newer to virtual reality and augmented reality here. So just to go over them, VR stands for virtual reality, where you're completely immersed in the virtual world. As you can see here on the left, um, that whole world's virtual and you're wearing the headset, whereas on the right, augmented reality, you're layering that virtual world on top of the physical world. Um, and then to take that up to the next step, a lot of people call it mixed reality uh, or MR, and this is where uh, the glasses you're wearing or your phone is able to sense flat surfaces and walls um, and create real world physics. So you could put a ball on a table, hit it off the table and it would bounce onto the ground and know where all of the objects are and as well as being able to hide objects behind real world objects. Um, and then lastly, XR or extended reality is a term that's um, becoming more popular over the past year, <clears throat> sorry, uh, and allows you to encompass all of those different acronyms. Um, that's how most people use it. with the next slide. <clears throat> and then uh, another thing I just wanted to quickly go over because it was interesting and I don't know if how many of you saw this, but last week PwC, uh, a large organization, global organization, did a study and released their findings last week on why VR uh, is important in the training area. So they did this study with um, many, many of their employees and some partners uh, where they put people through uh, an e-learning scenario, so on a computer, through a virtual reality scenario, uh, and as well as through a classroom scenario, learning the same things and seeing how those three different types of learning compared. Um, so all of these are on the, the VR versus classroom, and then the e-learning for the most part was uh, in between um, these percentages and these uh, increases. But um, they saw that user confidence increased by over 40% um, for the VR versus the classroom, as well as going through experiences, emotionally connecting. So when you're going through ethics scenarios or empathy type scenarios, they saw 3.75 uh, times more emotionally connected when going through those scenarios and realizing, oh, these are the things that I'm doing in my daily life that um, may be hurting somebody else and, and realizing why. Um, and then four times faster training compared to the classroom. So just being able to go through there faster and retain all that information in a faster amount of time. Then four times more focused. So because they're completely in the virtual world and not distracted by anything in the outside world, um, their um, learners were so much more focused. And then lastly, um, more than 52% decrease in costs. Um, so this depended on the class size but um, they calculated with having 3,000 students that need to go through a uh, learning experience, having it in VR decreased the cost by 52% compared to classrooms. So just some really interesting uh, insights that came out last week and thought it would be good to include them here. So who is Expert VR? Who are we? So my name is Evan Sittler and over here is Drew McNeil. 
uh, we're the two co-founders of Expert PR and have been working on Expert PR for four years now. Uh, and here you can see some of the simulations we've created and some of the clients that we've worked with. We've done a little bit of everything in the virtual reality space, but over the past year and a half or so, we've really focused in on working with um, researchers in academics as well as private researchers um, and doing lots of studies around VR in the classroom as well as um, empathy-based research and as you can see here like consumer behavior research so all kinds of stuff and over these uh, past two years one of our biggest um, projects has been with Brock University they just constructed the R3CL lab or the virtual augmented physics augmented and physical reality uh, consumer lab. And this lab allows researchers at Brock University as well as in the future, um, other researchers, both in the private sector or from other academic institutions to utilize all of the highest end virtual reality equipment uh, to do their research or to see how they could do research in their classes. Um, and with this, we consulted before the construction of the lab on what hardware to, to get and how to set up the lab and what to have in there, as well as now we're continuing, uh, continuing to work with them to get new hardware, to update hardware, and to develop the solutions that are going to be used in there. And obviously with COVID, seeing how we can use some of the capabilities that are in that lab to do things remotely. So unfortunately, obviously, not being able to use the lab, but um, to use some of the things that we've built up through that lab uh, to be able to continue to do research while we're not not in the space. Um, so one of the most interesting projects related to the topic of can VR replace classrooms over the past year we did a virtual classroom experiment with Martin Danahay who's in, in who's watching right now. Uh, and with this study, we had uh, five students meeting every week with Martin uh, in this virtual classroom that you see here. And we did it in VR chat um, just so that we didn't have to build the full platform. Um, but we've been looking into multiple other types of platforms like Altspace VR uh, and Engage and things along those lines. But VR chat was kind of the easiest for the customizability that we wanted. Um, and in this, we were able to write on whiteboards, sit down and interact like you normally would be able to talk, raise your hand. Uh, we brought the students' essays into the simulation so that they could read them over and so that the other students could see them, as well as uh, video files is something that we're looking at bringing in there and have been working on other platforms, bringing them in. Uh, and Martin hasn't uh, finished his paper yet, but uh, from what we've heard back from the students and heard so far, um, really great response, especially since uh, we were running this over the start of COVID. And as all classes got paused because of COVID-19, Martin was able to continue all of his classes because they were already doing them remotely in this way. Um, and this, this was a very basic classroom that we created, um, but the, the students at Martin and other professors are really interested in how this could then be built in to add all kinds of other experiences, whether that be science experiments or being able to go on trips to um, different locations around the world or back in time or into the future even. Um, and so lots of projects um, bringing together and making these experiences uh, a lot more immersive for, for learning. And then in another interesting area that we wanted to touch on, obviously, um, what, what I just talked about that was custom built and, and can, can cost a lot of money, but there's also a lot of applications available um, that don't cost any money or cost just $20 to get a game and can be used for, for classes. So two great examples that we've used with students in the past, and we've used these from ages from uh, I think 10 is probably the youngest that we've done. And then up to, we've done some experiences with people up to 95. So really these, these experiences can be used with all kinds of different age, age ranges. And it's really how you tailor it to what you're doing. So we have keep talking and nobody explodes. And in this game, you have this bomb that you see there and you have to do different puzzles to um, disable the bomb but you don't have the instructions to the puzzles. The instructions are outside of the VR headset or outside of the computer. Um, and you have a team of 
usually um, three or four people, but you can do more or less than that, uh, that are feeding you those instructions and working through how to diffuse the bomb. So we've seen this as a great uh, team building and leadership skills and communication skills um, activity. And, and although this isn't gonna replace the classroom, Having experiences like this that you can sprinkle throughout your learning and spend a half a day or a few hours going through um, well in the class really um, accelerates how fast people are able to retain these new skills or learn these new skills. Um, and so there's so many games out there that are like this that you can tailor towards what you're learning and might not be have created um, for, for your type of learning originally, but you can uh, play around with. And then on the other side of things, there's a lot of software that is out there for specific use cases. So Ovation Speech Trainer uh, is a speech training application where you go in and you're in front of an audience and they react to what you say. They might boo you, they might cheer you on, uh, and they, they know what words you're using too much. If you're saying um and ah a lot, uh, how fast you're speaking, your hand motions, gestures, um, where you're looking in the audience, if you're only focusing on one section, all kinds of things along those lines. So there's there's a lot of applications like that that are already built and you don't have to get custom developed for you. And you can just pay, um, whether it's $20 to buy the game or maybe a $20 subscription each month to, to utilize that software. So a much more cost-friendly way to start bringing uh, these types of experiences into your classroom. And then I um, wanted to touch here, um, this is just a great example, but there are many other applications out there for career exploration or for training as well. Um, so Career Labs VR is an application that a friend of ours uh, built uh, in with the Ontario government. Uh, and in, the, in this application, you open it up and there's all kinds of different jobs that you can learn, like that's listed here, welding, HVAC, repair, robotics technician, all these types of jobs, as well as I think they have 10 right now and they're about to add 10 more. Um, and these are great for, for students that are in, in, in a co-op position or in, are going into co-op next year, if they're in grade 11, let's say, um, and being able to experience different jobs that are available. Or even if you're later on in life a student and, and not knowing what career you want to switch into. Um, so being able to go through these experiences uh, and try out all these different careers, you can really understand, is this something that I want to do in the future? And then there's lots of applications that build on top of this where, okay, I want to become a welder and now I can go into a full welding uh, simulation where I learn all the different welding uh, techniques. So a great, uh, great application. There's a lot of other ones out there that if you're looking for them, we can help you point towards the right ones, um, but that can help in so many different ways for, for that hands-on training and learning. And then uh, from here, I'll pass it off to Rob Terrio to talk about uh, his experiences at Georgian College. Hey, everybody. So uh, just quickly by way of background, I'm limited to five minutes, so I'm going to have to speak rapidly. <laughs> so um, I'm um, a paramedic by trade. I've uh, been a paramedic for 36 years, um, been a paramedic educator for the last 20 years, and we introduced um, virtual reality into our paramedic lab a year and a half ago for patient simulation, uh, teaching empathy, and exploring a little bit of um, online learning in virtual reality. And um, so that led to a conversation with our president and vice president of academic, which led to uh, the creation of the position I'm in now on a two-year secondment as immersive technology lead. And so uh, my role, uh, I mean, uh, I'm really fortunate, it's a great job, uh, is to help faculty and um, uh, programs integrate virtual reality or augmented reality where uh, appropriate and, and desirable. So I've spent since January 6th, basically, I've spent all my time uh, communicating with programs and faculty members and with um, companies around the world uh, about VR applications. And we've been exploring uh, mostly off-the-shelf products um, for VR and you know I think uh, you know we have to address the elephant in the room you know the big the big question of will VR replace the classroom I I love that question because it's so provocative right I think you know, there's so many ways you can interpret that that question and of course um, you know 
the hair on the back of the neck of educators always stands up when you ask a question like that because they always worry about well will i lose my job you know if you're if you're not in a tenured position at a community college or something or you're an associate professor at a university you know is this going to replace me and so uh so the short answer is i don't think it's going to replace any teaching positions um and i wouldn't rule out virtual reality replacing the classroom in a in a big way uh, in an increasing way over the over the coming years uh, when you think about it you know, virtual reality, um, or sorry, uh, online learning has replaced the classroom. I did my undergraduate degree degree online. I did my master's degree online. Um, and I can tell you from my own experience, it was a very um, isolated experience. Uh, what I really missed uh, was the ability to interact with students, to have some live communication with students and with my profs. And out of all the courses I took online in both my undergrad and my master's, uh, there was only one course in my master's where we had face-to-face uh, -face meetings virtually, um, I think every two weeks. Um, so that was really sad. And I've always been a big believer, and I've been teaching online for many years, that it should be a blend of, of um, asynchronous and synchronous. Now, you know, with COVID, we've moved to, um, to emergency remote teaching um, educators don't like to call it online teaching because it doesn't really meet the, the, the robust criteria of a, of a proper online course. So we call it emergency remote teaching. Um, and, and that, for the, a lot of educators, that means uh, lecturing on Zoom or WebEx. And it's always been my view that uh, the quickest way to anesthetize your audience is to give a lecture on Zoom and mute everybody. Um, sort of like what we're doing now. Um, the advantage of something like this, though, is if you've got multiple people speaking, that makes it a little bit more engaging. <laughs> but, you know, um, virtual reality is very unique amongst educational technologies in that um, it allows for experiential learning. So doing things with your hands, which is really quite remarkable, and I'm really quite excited about it. Uh, and. Um, so there's amazing opportunities here, some exciting uh, future stuff coming up. And I'll just tell you um, briefly sort of what we're doing at, at Georgian. So we're piloting um, three programs and sort of continuing another program in the fall, um, um, assuming we get funding. And I'm cautiously optimistic we're going to get funding before uh, September comes along. So um, in our biotech degree, uh, they're going to be using a product called Nano, where they explore molecules in virtual reality and can interact with their instructor. They're also going to be, we're also uh, part of a focus group for InSpirit VR to look at chemistry and physics labs. In our Indigenous Studies uh, program, they're going to be teaching um, a, a course called Language in the Home online, where students will gather in a virtual house and um, go through the different rooms and talk about uh, the different uh, things that they see in the room and have discussions in in uh, in uh, their language and um, in our veterinary technician program um, students are going to be doing animal dissection in virtual reality uh, with victory xr and they're going to be doing um, reviewing animal anatomy from um, an open source program we we managed to secure from virginia tech and we had our uh, students sort of um, modify a little bit uh, for georgian in our um, advanced care paramedic program, we're gonna be using a program called Health Scholars, uh, which is an advanced cardiac life support uh, resuscitation program in virtual reality. And it's interesting because it, um, it uses voice recognition and artificial intelligence. So basically as a paramedic, you enter a room where someone's having chest pain or they're in cardiac arrest and all the um, surrounding avatars have name tags and you basically just bark out orders. So you call out to one person and say, can you check a pulse? You ask another member of the team, can you um, start chest compressions? Another member, can you start an intravenous line? Another member, can you give this drug in this dose? And um, the analytics at the end gives you an evaluation of sort of what you did and what sequence, whether you gave the correct drug in the right dose by the right route. Uh, and um, so it, it gives students an opportunity to practice their higher order uh, thinking, their decision making and uh, to develop those skills. Um, now, I, I sort of um, subdivide, uh, I mean, in virtual reality, there's simulation, there's creation, there's um, empathy, and the soft skills that Evan touched on are really exciting. There's, uh, you know, teaching live online in virtual reality. Um, and I know my five minutes is probably up. So the only thing I want to say out about um, 
teaching online in virtual reality is I really hope that we reimagine how we teach, uh, that we take the opportunity in virtual reality to do more um, interaction with students, more discussions, more debating, more hands-on learning, uh, and not create virtual classrooms that look like a classroom or look like an amphitheater. Um, you know, the image that Evan showed earlier was kind of a, a round table, which is good, you, you know, um, uh, better than seats in rows. But I, I really think this is a great opportunity to reimagine how we teach instead of trying to replicate the classroom in virtual reality. All right. Thanks a lot, Rob. That was uh, some great insight into uh, the different ways that we could use um, VR technology. Great to see that Georgian College has really taken a leap in terms of uh, bringing this into um, ways that students are learning. And uh, I think you're definitely right in terms of people needing to uh, build a new way for people to um, use this kind of technology for learning platforms. Um, so yeah, I think uh, to, for VR to replace the classroom is a bit of a stretch, but there's definitely tools in there that um, can be used for uh, certain scenarios. And um, I'm actually going to jump in and touch on that now. So over the past few months, we've spent a lot of time looking at VR platforms, um, 3D uh, platforms that work on PCs, tablets, different things, and trying to figure out um, what's ready to be used um, right now to teach and what isn't. And uh, really, it comes down to the hardware that uh, students currently have and trying to find ways to build stuff for those platforms. Um, so I'm going to uh, briefly cover three different softwares that we found that you could technically use today uh, to build um, uh, different uh, learning experiences for your students. And um, if you have any more questions about it, you can reach out to, obviously in the chat. Um, I uh, definitely would suggest to go to the websites and check out their demos that they have. Um, and what they really come down to is um, the fact that we can get to the uh, uh, devices that people have. So standalone headsets are really making a push in the VR space. Uh, the Oculus Quest being at a nice price point of around $500 Canadian allows um, some students to have it and a lot of people are uh, looking for the um, soon to be uh, headsets out there in the market for everyone to access and be able to um, get it down to a price point where it makes sense for you to go buy one for um, training purposes. But before we can really get to that, um, there's some softwares that work with both phones, tablets, iPads, laptops, and VR headsets. So the first one that I want to touch on here is Verbella. And this is a downloadable PC app. So you navigate to the environment using a keyboard and mouse um, and requires a little bit of uh, processing power, but uh, depending on the PC you have, um, should be able to run this. And essentially, um, it allows you to access their open campus where uh, you can schedule meetings with people, um, jump into worlds about 50 to 100 people. But uh, the cool part about it is being able to customize your own avatar um, and host private offices, auditoriums, and team suites. So um, this has been set up as a, as a professional service um, from, uh, from the business standpoint, and uh, currently HTC is utilizing this as their um, meeting software for their worldwide collaboration meetings and um, any conferences that they're having. But looking into this, um, they offer the, um, uh, the skills to be able to do screen sharing very easily, um, whether it's uh, links or um, yeah, your actual um, laptop screen, um, laser pointing tools so you can direct class while you're in there, and being able to take attendance. So um, being able to uh, yeah, create your own room, um, host your own sessions, and uh, have your students attend and have a very um, uh, 3D classroom um, environment for you to navigate around. Now, so that um, really covered the, the collaboration piece in terms of getting people together. Uh, Sirius Factory, the virtual training suite, allows you to build modules that you can send um, to participants or students. So this is built uh, for PC, uh, PC and tablet, sorry, and you're able to build custom modules based on branching dialogue systems. So essentially you can, uh, you can look at different ways to uh, branch out uh, the conversation pieces and actually build different scenarios for your students to go through um, so they're not going through the same experience over and over again. Um, there's a few pre-built scenarios uh, within it and uh, they have a, a focus on uh, professionalism. So you can go through a, a hotel scenario where there is a dissatisfied customer that you need to um, talk them through, figure out what their problem is and suggest the right solution for them. Um, and it gives you a grading system at the end of that as well. 
So uh, this is a great one to kind of uh, play around with and uh, see how you can apply current training methods into what they already have available as a platform and building conversations. And then the third one I want to talk about is LearnBright. Uh, this one's uh, interesting, very similar to VTS in terms of building your own um, uh, modules, branching dialogue systems, grading systems, um, and you can actually um, upload your own 3D models into the scenario as well. But this one is actually, uh, you can access it through tablet, um, phone, PC, and, uh, and VR as well um, as a third piece. And uh, the, the way they're able to do this is it's all done on the web. So instead of downloading um, an app uh, from an app store, you're actually just entering a URL code and accessing it that way. So you can build it um, from a URL, send it to people, and then they can access it through any device they have on the URL as well. So those are three platforms that are kind of currently available. I just wanted to touch on uh, one piece that Expert VR is looking to build in terms of sending out VR simulations to people who actually have VR headsets. And uh, this is kind of uh, looking towards the future when people do have devices in their houses, um, or if we can find a way to actually get headsets to students uh, through funding opportunities. Um, and essentially what we built is a platform for you to upload simulations directly to the website, hosting grant permissions to different participants that might be able to access it, and then send that directly to those participants. And then moving forward, we're looking to collect and analyze um, data. So for uh, research purposes beyond teaching, um, actually being able to have students go through simulations, um, track the data that they're doing and have it sent directly back um, so that you are able to view it all in the web portal. And the way this is kind of kind of work out and uh, we see this playing through is um, once 5G, comes into play. We're working with the Ontario Centre of Excellence to test how we can actually stream our VR simulations from a computer directly to the headsets uh, versus having to have them download executable files. And that's all we have for you today, guys. Uh, thank you for listening, and we are excited to take any questions you may have. Um, Rob, I believe here as well for any questions, Steve. Yeah, so to start off, one of the uh, questions or comments I saw here is thought that HTC was working with Engage. Um, so Engage VR is another platform where you can host classrooms. So you're correct, they are working with Engage. They're also working with Rubella. So Engage, they're looking for more of uh, the, the classes and the um, uh, smaller group meetings, whereas Rubella is to have multiple classes and bigger groups and uh, bigger lectures. Um, so two different, uh, two different types of software. Um, we didn't touch on Engage, but another um, great software for hosting uh, uh, classes. And they have a large library of, as well of uh, different 3D models that you can pull in uh, for those classes. So yeah, Engage VR. Frozen. I have not froze there. Hopefully it comes back here in a second. There's great. Oh, there we go. Come back. You, you, want, you want to recap the last 10 seconds there, Evan? Yeah, yeah. I was just yeah saying, once again, engage, great for, for smaller classes and uh, for being able to bring in their library of 3D models uh, and animations. And then Verbella, great for those larger classes or larger events. Um, another question here from... <clears throat> Todd, is uh, how is adoption process with college administrators? Are they excited or is this an RG? Uh, well, I can only answer from my perspective that it really varies from college to college. Um, in fact, I, I'm really quite shocked that I end up in the position I'm in because I, um, you know, when I first applied for about $25,000 in funding and hardware and software, I thought for sure, uh, I, you know, it's, it, I, let me back up a bit. So, First of all, when it comes to colleges and universities, at least in Canada, uh, the way it works for funding is, um, unless you're applying for grant funding, there's basically, there's no money, there's no money, there's no money, then suddenly there's a lot of money. And the Dean comes to us and says, we need to spend $180,000 in the next month to get your quotes ready. So I always have quotes ready. Uh, just uh, always done that in the last 20 years that I've been teaching. And so I had like a $25,000 worth of uh, requests um, ready. And to my amazement, we got it. 
But when I talked with our um, president and vice president academic initially, their response was that new technologies don't get funding or human resources until they reach a threshold level of interest. And I, I tried to make the case with them that it may never reach that threshold level of interest uh, unless we invest in it first. Because <laughs> I find a lot of colleges, you know, because the funding sort of works that way, you have no money until you have, suddenly have a lot of money. A lot of colleges, and I can give you examples, I won't name names, but they'll get like, you know, 120 grand, they'll buy a whole bunch of headsets, and then they'll sit in a closet and do nothing. And uh, so I said to them, look, I, I really think this needs leadership, it needs a plan, and and that's what I did, right? So I, uh, I, I had a plan, I had some ideas of how to integrate it, and that's sort of um, how we move forward with that. Oh, yeah, that's great. And I've seen seen a few other colleges and universities appoint somebody in a position like you that's monitoring everything. And I think those are the those are the institutions that have been doing it best because it definitely does take that management to to make sure that it's done properly across the university or college. Yeah, and the other the other piece too is to you know once you get it rolling, um, if you're a researcher, there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. There's a lot of exciting stuff to research. Um, so I want to get it going, and then we'll start doing some research. Now, we've we've had it in paramedic for a while. So um, this fall, we're going to do a research project associated with this advanced cardiac life support training uh, module in virtual reality. And uh, I'll just mention, so there's a, a, an emergency room physician by the name of Tim Kobold, who's in uh, Columbia, Missouri. And I connected with him online, never met the guy in person, person, really great guy, cool guy. So he's doing a study using the same application with his emergency room residents. And, uh, you know, earlier, Evan, you mentioned, uh, you know, keep talking and no one explodes as a team building or team exercise. Well, uh, he uses that with his eMERGE docs because as you can well imagine, when you're training as an emergency physician and it's life and death, it's very stressful, right? But uh, keep talking and no one explodes is a, is a great exercise where, you know, you, you're looking at the bomb in virtual reality, everyone else is looking at the paper instructions and you have to act quickly and you have to act very calmly. And that's exactly the kind of soft skill, you know, team management that physicians need. So there's opportunities to research even something like that, you know, compared to other methods of uh, teaching those soft skills. Yeah, that's that's a great point to research that. And, and definitely we've seen, uh, I've seen videos of actual bomb technicians trying it out and all kinds of different people trying out th the game. And I think there's so many games out there like that, that you originally look at as a, as a gaming uh, experience and, and no like learning coming from it. But yeah, if you, if you apply it in the correct way, there's, there's so many applications that are already built that, that put you into those high stress uh, situations. Yeah. Or, yeah. So, and, and Tim Go Cobalt's also doing <laughs> You gotta love this guy, he's a machine. I love these people who just work, 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 research, research, <laughs> research. This guy is also doing a study on stress reduction with his eMERGE docs. So they, um, you know, they, they fill out a, a, a form, uh, a, a, you know, a, a form that's been used in research in the past to measure their stress levels. And then they go into five minutes of virtual reality and he set up this little room with a sun lamp and an umbrella and they get to, you know, lay down on a lawn chair and they put these VR goggles on. And then he measures the stress levels at the end of the five minute session. <laughs> and uh, so I'm pretty excited about uh, uh, seeing those, uh, those published in the not too distant future. Yeah, that'll be really interesting. There's a lot of those types of applications starting to come out and it's, it's interesting to see how much they can, they can help people, especially like you're saying, if in between, in, not in between shifts, but like in between uh, an hour of work quickly being able to jump in there and de-stress. Um, instead of having to fly to that beach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Got another question here from the crowd. Um, one of the common criticisms that I've found when using VR for teaching purposes is that it requires a lot of space and the cost is still high in developing countries. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Can I take that one again? Yeah, yep. for sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Standalone virtual reality headsets, in, in my personal view, is the way to go for colleges and universities. Um, so you're not taking up space. What we're doing with our pilots is we're, uh, we're purchasing headsets and we're shipping that, them out to students' homes. We're doing small cohorts, so I think it's important to, to start small. Um, and you know, to sort of address one of the other questions in the, in the, in the chat, um, you know, what about technology evolving and new headsets coming out? And I think that's why it's important to pilot 
something that's small, use a you know, small number of headsets, ship them out, try them, get feedback from the students, maybe do some research around it. Um, and then a new headset comes out next year and you go with that. Um, you know, with any new technology, especially when it's evolving, it's easy to sit back and end up suffering from uh, paralysis from analysis, you know, waiting for the right, the right tech to come along. And uh, I, I think that you just fall behind the curve. And in my view, it's so important for educators to start exploring virtual reality now uh, for a couple of reasons. One, so that they have an understanding of the implications of it and, and that the implications of experiential learning in a place that feels like you're in a real place, unlike Second Life, you know, you feel like you're present. And two, it's important for educators to communicate to um, the, the developers of these software programs so that it has some sound pedagogy. You know, it's not just a place that you go to and uh, the developers just expect that learning will happen. Learning is a lot more complicated. Uh, you know, when, when I went to college, I just thought lectures are what you do, but uh, lectures are probably the least effective way of teaching, the least effective way for students to learn. And, uh, you know, I had to go through this 12-step program for lecture holics when I started teaching at college. And virtual reality gives us uh, a medium and opportunity to do teaching that's much more hands-on, that's much more interactive and engaging. For sure, and I, I think that's a, a great point about uh, making sure that the teaching is, uh, you're actually learning from the experience versus just developing it to have a space. Um, and for anybody here that's looking to get those types of spaces developed, when you're reaching out to uh, those development companies, whether it be us as expert VR or anybody else, mm -hmm. um, sitting down with them and making sure that you have a plan of how often you're meeting with an industry expert and how often you're gonna have check-ins with that company. Um, because yeah, you wanna have, um, we or as an example, we know at Expert VR, we're the experts in developing the simulations, but we're not the experts in teaching. So we know that we need to have that person there and any other development company um, should also know that as well. So if you're doing anything custom, making sure that uh, you're, you're thinking of that as you, as you start to develop. Yeah, can I just add a little bit more about um, colleges and funding and stuff? So, so I was really lucky. Um, honestly, don't know how I fell into this position or how I managed to convince our senior management that we should explore this stuff, but so I got lucky. There's a college just down the street from us. Well, it's about a 45-minute drive from us, much bigger college, um, and they, they don't support endorsed VR at all. Um, I think eventually, you know, the lights will go, go on and, and they will. But you know the interesting thing about colleges and universities is um, innovation always happens at the faculty level, uh, the staff level, right? And and if you're an educator, you know that there are some brilliant people that you work with who are doing some really in innovative stuff, and a lot of times it flies under the radar. And so um, I would say a couple of things. One, if you're um, if you're an innovator and you are interested in exploring virtual reality on your own, if you, if you can afford it or get funding even for a single headset, I would just go ahead and do it, number one. Number two, I would say um, promote what you're doing. So, you know, if you've got a media department, uh, communications and media department, communicate with them and tell them what you're doing, get it showcased, get it in the media, uh, because then, you know, your senior managers see it in the news, and they go, whoa, what's uh, that person doing? <laughs> That's amazing. And, uh, you know, you start to generate conversations and other faculty start to get interested and, uh, you know, it's sort of snowballs uh, after, after a while. And so, you know, if my colleague at this other college down the street, when she did something innovative, um, I retweeted the heck out of it um, so that, and I, and I included her senior administrators of the college so they would see me tweeting the heck out of it. And uh, it just gave what she was doing more attention, which it really deserved, so. No, yeah, and I think that's important too, just sharing what other people are up to because like right now we're, we're so, everybody's so new to it that we, we all benefit from, uh, from these new innovations, so. Yeah. All right, um, next question we kind of have here, which I think we touched on a little bit already, but um, please say a little bit more about the hardware. Students are poor and doing VR full day on a phone um, doesn't seem feasible. What are the minimum uh, what is minimum for a successful experience? And I think that really comes down to planning um, how the person is going to interact with it on the device that you're planning to deliver it for. 
Yeah, usually what we say, and Rob, you can touch more on this, but usually what, what we say is the Oculus Quest is kind of the lowest limit. Uh, I think the Oculus Go has a couple interesting areas, but um, but you can't really build on, on that. So we say the Oculus Quest is kind of the lower limit so that um, you so that even if you're building a small simulation, um, you can still use that hardware down the road. Um, and I think going back to what Rob said as well, um, there are new headsets coming out every year. Um, but um, as an example, we've had an HTC Vive since it came out uh, four years ago or whenever that was. Um, so it's still, lots of this hardware is still going to work for multiple years, even if it's not the newest and best. Yeah, I would say the first and most important thing to do is look at uh, what it is you teach that, that maybe is difficult to teach um, because your labs are closed and you've got, you know, your students aren't able to get together for hands-on or you've got something that, you know, as um, Jeremy Balenson from Stanford University would say, something that you want to teach that's either dangerous, impossible, impractical, counterintuitive or expensive. You know, so if you want to teach how to maintain a wind turbine, probably a lot easier in virtual reality than climbing up a wind turbine or getting even getting access to wind turbine. Um, you know, I want to teach paramedic students and nursing students how to save lives. Uh, a lot safer to do it in virtual reality, where if you give the wrong drug and the animated character dies, <laughs> no one has died in real life. Um, so I would, number one, look at your learning objectives, look at uh, what it is you hope to accomplish from a teaching perspective, and does the virtual reality, uh, you know, meet that that um, learning outcome, or, you know, ideally you want virtual reality applications that hit on several learning outcomes, not just one, because, uh, you know, if it only hits one or two, it may not be worth return on investment. Yeah, that's a great point. I think you like uh, also the length of the experience is a good thing to take in uh, to consideration as I don't think anyone wants to be in VR for eight hours straight, five days a week. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it really needs to be, um, if you're using a phone, use it for 15, 20 minutes, headsets, 15, 20 minutes, an hour, whatever the case may be to get the point across and then bring that back to the traditional learning methods. So to our pilot programs, I've been recommending 30 minutes a week at most. So, you know, you think about it, it's, it's uh, virtual reality blended with some Zoom or WebEx calls blended with some asynchronous online learning. And eventually VR may be able to take bigger portions. Uh, you know, as the heads get, get smaller and faster and more comfortable and the program content expands, uh, we might see more and more virtual reality. So, you know, will VR replace a classroom? I, I wouldn't rule it out, <laughs> you know. In, uh, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, that might be where teachers and students are meeting is in virtual reality and there'll be fewer bricks and mortar schools. Now, um, I'm going out on a bit of a limb because I said that about MOOCs and when I saw MOOCs, you know, massive open online uh, courses, uh, in my mind, there was no way that was gonna replace bricks and mortars, but VR, augmented reality, it's very different. Yeah, I think being able to bring augmented reality in as well so you can, have a full VR experience and then step into an augmented reality world where you're just looking at your room and you can just see each other like sitting around the room and having a discussion. So especially just what it means on your eyes uh, and and uh, the fatigue from that, I think, yeah, having, um, uh, having that mixture between the VR and AR is going to be huge in the future. Yeah. Here's another good question. Um, how is VR in colleges and universities different from virtual worlds such as Second Life or PlayStation Home in previous years? Which aspect do you think is more important for education, the virtual environment or the headset itself? Mm, I, well, I think it's the experience that's, uh, that's the most important. So Second Life is great and a lot of educators have used Second Life and there's a lot of research based on Second Life and um, it was a phenomenal platform and still is a pretty interesting platform. Um, uh, the difference with immersive virtual reality is the sense of presence, the sense of feeling like you're actually there, you know, making contact with another person, even in avatar form, feels like you're with them. Uh, you know, the first time I attended an event in virtual reality, I sat a little close too close to this guy and I immediately felt awkward and said sorry and because I'm Canadian I said sorry never Americans say excuse me and I moved over a few inches right I teleported over a couple of inches <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
you know, uh, Paula and Tony who are here, some other people who are here who've been to events in Altspace VR, uh, they'll tell you too that, you know, it's great to attend lectures in, in virtual reality, but I find the best part for me is um, those group discussions after the event and, uh, you know, having those one-on-one -on -one discussions and one-on-three discussions. For sure. <laughs> Um, another question here, I think it's directed uh, directly at you, Rob. Um, do you use more time preparing in VR um, than usual on site? Depends on, depends on what you're teaching. Uh, might be more, might be less. So if I was giving, uh, I guess, a presentation online, um, I really hate, I really want to try to avoid giving a lecture. Um, I like having panel discussions. And it's fun to have a panel discussion, then have breakout groups and do case studies and things, things like that in virtual reality. And that may take a little bit of time to prepare to uh, you know, go into virtual reality in advance and get your slides ready and get uh, 3D objects ready and that sort of thing. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, if, uh, if you're going into a chemistry lab in virtual reality um, and it's your fourth time in there and you've done your you know, uh, chemistry lab, uh, safety training and everything else, you just go in and you do your experiments and the, the instructor just acts as the rumble strip, you know, just sort of comes around and makes sure people are doing what they need to be doing and, you know, uh, answers any questions and, you know, should they mix the wrong chemicals together, they'll, you know, maybe stop, prevent that from happening or they'll all explode together. But in real life, they're still alive. So, so yeah, it, it really depends on the application, whether it's more prep or less prep. That's a good point. I find, um, I think when we were setting up the uh, virtual classroom, obviously you got to think a lot more um, in the beginning of terms of what you want to deliver and how it's all going to work together. Um, but then it does become pretty easy once it is set up. So, Yeah, it's as well. We found uh, with the virtual classroom we did an hour um, training session with all the students beforehand to answer all of their questions on how the headset worked. And then uh, the first couple uh, meetings, we were we were also there in the classroom to answer any questions or make sure people were getting in properly. Um, so just, I think it's, yeah, that, that learning curve at the start, being prepared for that. And then as, as you get into it, that, that will decrease. Yeah, and then by week three, we were um, off, hands off, uh, yeah. class was running by itself, so. Um, yeah, you know, when you're, um, if you're giving a lecture online using Zoom or WebEx, um, you can take one or two approaches. You can just go on there, give a lecture, put everyone on mute and answer questions at the end. That's a terrible way to teach, a terrible way for students to learn. Although students love to just sit there passively, um, you know, <laughs> they, they, they generally don't like being active, but if you make them active, if you do activities where they're active, they're, they appreciate it after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you could put literally like no effort into a lecture on Zoom, or you can put a lot of effort into it and make it more interactive. So yeah, in some cases, you know, good teachers take more time to do work. But, you know, of course, the difficulty in teaching in general is we always do more work than we're paid for. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my goal in life has always been to try to work smarter, not harder. Um, and at age 61, I'm still working on it. So... Yeah. don't have a real great answer. <laughs> so that's fair. All right, I think uh, this one's for you and me, Evan. Um, what type of skills and software um, would I have to learn to create material in VR? I have a master's degree in computer science and I'm an instructor and I would like to enter the VR sector. Yeah, so I think if, if you have a background in computer science, you probably can pick up uh, a new coding language not too difficultly, depending on what languages you're proficient in already. Um, so yeah, I think looking into C Sharp or C++, if uh, I don't want to get too into the weeds with coding language, but uh, yeah, C Sharp or C++, uh, and C Sharp is for the Unity game engine, and C++ is for the Unreal game engine. Uh, Unreal also has the option for node-based coding, so it's uh, a lot simpler if you don't know coding language, just being able to basically connect boxes, um, but it can get complicated. Um, so yeah, I would, it, with that type of background, I would really look into Unity or Unreal and just seeing what free 3D models you can get online. There's lots of uh, sources like Sketchfab um, and CG Trader and those types of websites that have um, some 3D models for free. Uh, Google Poly is another good one. Um, they're not all going to be amazing models, but if you have that coding background, you can start dropping them in there and learn how 
how the the software works uh, and make your own simulations. So. Yeah, and then over and above that, there's um, obviously the uh, software I touched on where it's a little bit more drag and drop, a little bit uh, less customizable. Um, so depending on what you're looking for, like there might be a uh, kind of blanket solution that you can utilize and uh, develop on their platform. But anything over and above that, you definitely want to look into uh, the two game engines that Evan just mentioned, uh, Unreal and Unity. Yeah, and Paul just made a great point there too as well. The Alt Space World Editor, as well as uh, VR Chat and Rec Room, they have some pretty good uh, world editors as well. So being able to jump into those uh, in in 3D in, in VR and edit them directly um, is great, depending on on what experience you're trying to create. Mm -hmm. And then here's a here's actually a comment from um, Martin, who is the professor at Brock University that we worked with to launch the VR Classroom, who also used Second Life uh, in a previous research study. Um, who says, from my perspective, the advantage of 3D VR over Second Life is the bodily motion available, which makes the sense of personal connection a lot stronger. And you do really feel uh, feel that, whether it's Alt Space, VR Chat, any of the ones where um, you can talk with your hands and you see the nodding and uh, actually getting a feedback from the uh, body language is a, is a huge advantage in terms of um, the new stuff versus Second Life, yeah. Seeing a few people or somebody ask here uh, if this is being recorded, yeah, we'll... It's being recorded and we'll send it out to everybody uh, at, at the end or, or a few hours later. Um, so yeah, for sure. As well, um, Tony just commented here that he's on his third headset and in hindsight he would have started or would have wished to start it with the Quest and a gaming PC as opposed to the Oculus Go that he got or the hardwired Vive that he has. Um, and yeah, I can <clears throat> completely agree. We have one of every headset uh, at Expert VR at least and play around with all of them. Um, but Oculus Quest is definitely the one that we keep going back to just because it's uh, when we're playing games ourselves or doing experiences ourselves, just because it's so easy to, to jump into. And now that you can uh, link it with the cable that comes in the box to your, to your gaming PC, if you have that ability, it basically turns into a Rift S, which is uh, comparable to a five. So, so having all that flexibility is just, uh, is so great. And actually on that note, uh, we received the Pico Neo 2i this week, um, which is a standalone competitor to the Oculus Quest. Mm -hmm. um, it has eye tracking built in and you can stream from your PC content. Um, and it's lined up, uh, um, jumping into it the first time, the quality uh, in my perspective was a lot better than the Oculus Quest. Um, but lacks the store that comes with it in terms of Oculus providing a lot of content. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. we haven't even, we haven't even touched on biometrics or haptics in this conversation. It could be an entirely separate topic. But uh, the biometrics piece is really interesting to me, and I think um, you know, as educators, we have to think very carefully about the ethics and the risks to students in virtual reality. Like, for example, my paramedic students um, have a virtual reality experience where they go to a terrorist attack where. Uh, the driver of a bus drives into a hotel and kills a few people and injures others, and the paramedic student has to go in and triage. Um, and, you know, as a 36-year paramedic veteran, I, I try that triage scenario, and it's interesting to me and doesn't bother me at all, but I have no idea what kind of effect it's going to have on my, my first semester students. So we use it in our fourth semester students. And, you know, there's an opportunity to, with biometrics, with eye tracking and checking tracking pupillary dilation and pulse and so on and so forth, we can do some stress inoculation training for them. Uh, we can measure stress levels and we can slowly sort of scaffold and build them up to the point where they can handle some really uh, horrific uh, life and death stuff. Um, in the real world right now, we, we don't really have that opportunity. Um, so VR pre presents a unique opportunity in the real world. I have students who, you know, they, they graduate and two weeks later, they go to a, a murder-suicide, uh, which is just overwhelming for them. So uh, I think VR offers another experiential learning platform where we can uh, prepare um, students and physicians, nurses, um, people working in dangerous jobs uh, much better uh, for those um, events. Oh yeah, I think that's a great point, obviously, in those types of events. it's. Uh, could be very jarring going into it in the real world, but but even even in the lower level, like I was mentioning with career, career labs VR and going into like welding or anything, just being able to experience really any career that you're thinking about going into uh, before you actually do it uh, could save students uh, years of their life in studying that and then noticing that this isn't what they want to, to do with, uh, in their career. Yeah. 
All right. Um, so just, uh, we got about a minute and a half here. I think we got another comment. And then one last question for uh, us to decide on. So um, Tony provides some good insight here. On finding free 3D models, you can even rip and reuse any 3D model that comes stock within PowerPoint. And you don't even need the cable to connect the Quest to a gaming PC. Virtual desktop and a stable high-speed internet connection is all you need. I will definitely try that. Thanks. <laughs> yes, and then, one, uh, thing to, one thing to mention about the virtual desktop, it is great. The only thing is Oculus has been going back and forth with them if they're going to keep allowing that to be on the Quest. So it works great right now, but it might be something that gets discontinued or gets uh, you're going to have to do some more uh, back-end work to, to get it onto the Quest. Um, so just to keep that in mind. With that thought, Evan, do you think that Oculus will be launching their own? version with with fico having that and i think uh with them having the link cable it's definitely where oculus is going to head um they're they're even right now i know a lot of people use um, side quest to put games onto onto their quest which is it's like a third-party software that hosts a library of games and applications uh and uh they're they're making their own version of that as well so yeah i think yeah tony and paula um are doing some brilliant stuff in virtual reality and they would make great guests on uh, one of your webinars in the future, just by the way. Excellent. Yeah, well, definitely. Yeah, we'll be connecting after this for sure. <laughs> Thanks a lot for jamming in. Um, and then uh, other question here, rules of thumb when to go VR versus AR. And I think this will be our last question to kind of wrap up here. Yeah, so Charlie Fink described it best. He said, VR is a toddler and AR is still a fetus. Um, I, I think VR, <laughs> VR is really, um, you know, uh, worth exploring right now in education. Augmented reality is a whole different approach, and I think uh, it's got really exciting potential, but um, not, not quite sure it's ready for, it's, VR is just barely ready for prime time. AR is not quite there for education, in, in my personal view, but there's some interesting stuff with AR, no question. Yeah, and like um, from a from a research perspective, at least um, kind of what we've been seeing is depending on what you want to research and uh, how much you want to put them into uh, a, a full experience versus like, uh, let's say you're researching um, some small objects and uh, you want to test like two different labels, AR might be a good fit for that. But also if you want to test whether they're choosing that while they're at a store or at the mall or wherever the case may be, you need VR to really put them in that um, full experience kind of thing. Um, so it's back to the uh, uh, design process and exactly how um, you mm -hmm. want them to work with the scenario that you have built for them. Yeah. All right, guys, 201. That was a great hour of conversation. Uh, I have to thank Rob again for joining us today. Um, you were a great ad and uh, thanks for all your input in terms of um, your experience with Ge Georgian College and um, all your VR experience as well. Thank you. And then um, just to recap again, uh, we have recorded this entire session. We'll be sending it out to everyone who attended today. And if you have any further questions um, for myself and Evan, you see our information on the screen. I believe Rob posted in the chat all of his uh, information as well if you want to connect with him directly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will look forward to hosting another one of these webinars. Um, if you guys have ideas for topics, you can send them our way as well. Um, we should be doing another one in about uh, a month. So. All right, guys. Thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you all later.